Hello everyone, this is Jonathan Little. I'm here today with the 122nd episode of Weekly Poker Hand. This hand is from the bubble of a $3,500 buy-in World Poker Tour event. We're down to 106 players and 100 people get paid. So here we are. A tightish kid makes it 10,500 from under the gun and I have ace king of clubs on the button. He has 180,000 yeah, 180, to start the hand. I have 200,000. A lot of people in this spot just three bet without really thinking about it. But I think on the bubble, you need to be much more cautious because really, is this tightish kid blasting off in this scenario? I would say almost certainly not because we are nearing the bubble. Obviously, the other stacks at the table are incredibly relevant because if some players have, well, if I say the average stack is 30K, well, then this guy may be much more inclined to open wide compared to if the average stack is 150K or 400K. So that's always important, and that is not listed. I actually did a webinar with Scott Clements in conjunction with Excelling at No Limit Hold'em a while back. Um, if you want access to that, you can email me at support at jonathanlittlepoker.com, and we will find that for you. But um, we discussed how to play on the bubble. That was the whole point of the webinar, and it was very well received. So if you're into learning about the bubble and you're tired of bubbling, and you want to make sure that you get through the bubble winning chips, I think that it's mandatory to understand a lot of these principles. So there is a lot of missing information here, but this is all we have. Anyway, I'm going to call in this spot pretty much every time because I don't want to re-raise and get it all in. Remember how in the previous episode of Weekly Poker Hand, we had pocket kings versus a tilty guy? And I mentioned how I really don't three bet under the gun raisers very often at all. Here's a much better example of a standard spot where this tightish guy should have a strong range. So therefore, I'm just not going to three bet him. You don't have to. It's not necessary. So I do like to just call and we'll see a flop. It's okay to see flops. We see a pretty good flop. It comes jack, three, two, all clubs. I have the ace, king of clubs, so I flop the nut flush. <laughs> it's always good when this happens. So my opponent leads small into me, bets 10,000 into the 33,000 pot, and I think this is just a good strategy. It's a good, solid bet size that's going to be hard to do too much against. Because notice here, if I fold, my opponent got away with a cheap bluff, and if I call, well, it doesn't really cost him much, and he probably has some equity. Nor obviously, here he doesn't have equity, but in general, he's going to have some equity. So in the spot, do we raise or do we call? And I think calling is going to be the right play, which is what I do. And the reason for that is because notice if my opponent bets the turn and bets the river, say bets 30 on the turn and then 50 on the river, we'll be able to shove very realistically and get a lot of money in the pot. So I like that. Um, if he checks me on the turn, I can bet the turn and then bet the river and get a lot of money in the pot. So we're not really concerned with building the pot here. We're more so concerned with not letting our opponent fold. You'll find that very often... There are a lot of overriding factors that determine your play. We actually discuss this a lot at pokercoaching.com, which is my interactive poker training site. Um, you can go there and you can get a free peek at it. You can try out one of the quizzes and see what all we do there at pokercoaching.com. But we talk about the factors that override specific situations. And here, the overriding factor is not protecting our hand. It's not building the pot. It is keeping our opponent in. So here, we want to keep... And that's a function of the sack size and strength of my hand. So it turns a three of spades, pairs the board. That's not what we want to see. Our opponent checks, and now I need to bet. We want to get money in the pot at this point. So now when my opponent checks, we do have to risk letting him fold because now we do want to continue getting money in the pot. When he checks the turn, he very... Oh, he's not going to have very many hands stronger than top pair. So now we need to bet on the smaller side because we're trying to get called by pocket nines or ace king offsuit or something like that. So this is a spot where I can bet small with a lot of my range, and there's not a whole lot my opponent can do about this. He's probably going to fold a lot of the time, really. But pretty shockingly to me, he check raises to 40K. So I bet 16, he makes it 40. What in the world is happening here? Notice this is actually a very tiny raise. I have to put in 25K to win the 54 in the pot plus the additional 55 that's in there. So I have to put in 20 Five to try to win a hundred to win 90 or 100 no 110 so i don't need to win very often at all to stick around so what what chance would my opponent really want me to stick around with well it seems like he must have a full house right or a flush so if he has a full house i'm obviously crushed if he has a flush i'm obviously crushed i'm sorry he's obviously crushed so if i shove he's probably always going to call with that whole range and you know maybe we're roughly flipping versus it but really, if you think about it, which clubs should he be raising from early position? And would he play 8-7 of clubs this way? 
I'm not really buying it. Um, that being said, I mean, what full houses are there? There's only pocket jacks, pocket threes, and pocket twos. Obviously, threes is full is four of a kind, but it's close enough. So this is an interesting spot where my opponent's not representing a very wide range of hands. He's representing very few combinations of hands, right? And, I mean, one of the big factors here is that I have the ace and the king of clubs, so he just can't have ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-ten, ace-nine, etc. And he also can't have king-queen, king-jack, king-ten, etc. So we block a lot of the value hands my opponent should have. So we effectively have a bluff catcher at this point. Our hand has gone from being obviously the nuts, we're trying to get the money in, to now it's like, ugh, <laughs> let's try to not go broke here. So I just like to call the 24K. Here we get to the river, rivers of five of diamonds. That's a pretty nice card for me to see. And my opponent bets 75K into the 134K pot. So a pretty hefty bet. He had 130K in the stack going to the river. So he bet a little bit more than half of his remaining stack. And remember, we're on the bubble, right? So maybe in some world where I'm very convinced my opponent doesn't have a full house, I could consider shoving here. But in this exact scenario, I think shoving would be a very, very bad play because we are on the bubble and also because I think it's somewhat likely that we're in horrible shape. So here I have a bluff catcher. If you remember back to a previous, to the few, to a few episodes ago, if you've not listened or watched the previous episodes, they're all available on jonathanlillipoker.com slash WPH, stands for Weekly Poker Hand. You can also listen to them on Audible and lots of other places. So they are available. If you like weekly poker hand, I suggest you just spend a day and listen to the more every morning you listen to an episode, you'll get caught up really fast. I actually listen to a lot of podcasts and I'm pretty silly about it. I actually listen to like all of the episodes. If I find a podcast that has 500 episodes, well, I'm going back to episode one and starting from the beginning. So I'm kind of a weirdo. <laughs> I'm a completionist freak. I want to make sure I've studied everything possible. Anyway, in this spot, I think calling is the only play. I remember back to the previous episodes where I think our opponent had king five on king, 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 eight. I don't know, king, king, eight, jack, four, or something like that. And my opponent had king five and he raised the river. This is a very similar spot to that, where if I raise, it is a huge blunder because we're only going to get called, I think, whenever we are beat. And that's a disaster. Whereas here, I can easily call and beat some flushes. And I also beat some bluffs, right? I don't think it's impossible for my opponent to have a random ace of hearts, king of clubs that he decided to turn into a bluff or maybe even something like six, five that, that he decided to turn into a bluff on the turn. So I, I think calling is the only play and I would call here in this spot, even if we were not on the bubble. Opponent does turn up king, queen of diamonds. That's an interesting bluff because he has no blockers. Usually when you're bluffing, you want to have some sort of blocker that makes it harder for your opponent to have a flush. Remember how I just mentioned ace of hearts, queen of clubs, or even, you know, queen of clubs something, but he did raise under the gun, so he shouldn't have like king or queen of clubs, nine of spades, right? If he does have the queen of clubs, notice he blocks ace, queen, king, queen, and queen, 10 of clubs. And those are hands that I very easily could have. But when he has king, queen of diamonds, I could just have all of the flushes. So I think this was a pretty big blunder by my opponent. Obviously, it looks strong, and it turned my my very strong hand into a bluff catcher, but I don't know. I mean, maybe this is just a sweet play. It's kind of difficult to figure out if this is a good play or not because when I call my opponent's flop bet, my range should be wide. The real question there becomes, what is my turn betting range when he checks to me? And it's probably just jacks or better. I'm probably checking back a lot of the marginal made hands because I don't want to play a big pot on the bubble, right? So I think whenever he check raises me on the turn and I call, I think he just has to be getting out of the way. Assuming he even does want to check raise. I think the check raise may be overly optimistic in the first place. So yeah, that's an interesting spot. Um, I don't really like my opponent's play. Someone a while back asked me to assess my opponent's play in these spots, and I don't like this one. So that's me it for this episode of Weekly Poker Hand. I want to thank you for being here. If you have any questions or comments, definitely let me know on Twitter at Jonathan Little. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thanks for being here today.